<laughs> I have pushed the button. Now we're cool. waiting on it to kick over. And see, I learned I have to actually refresh this thing because for some reason, sometimes the stream will just continue playing whatever source it was playing. And now it's music. It's still music. It's, 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 it's. <laughs> Still, oh, 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 that's looking good. Hey, there's a bunch of faces. All right. Hello, DEF CON. Welcome to your early morning Sunday content. Um, my name is Fallible. We have got uh, Jetril here. Uh, joining us from the speaker side is Mickey and Jesse with their uh, the Q&A portion for their talk of Bites in Disguise. So... I want to, uh, um, oh, hold on, before I do this, I have one more button I have to push on my side. Okay. So, before we get going here, I guess um, I'd like for the two of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and your DEF CON history, because I know that uh, neither of you are, are strangers to uh, uh, the uh, hanging out in the desert with a bunch of geeks for a weekend. So, um, tell us a little, about, a little about yourselves. Go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> okay, I can start that. Uh, so I, I first started coming to DEF CON in uh, 2003 when I was still back at the Alexis Park and was playing CTF uh, back then and uh, ended up winning a couple black badges. So I've been coming to DEF CON every year since 2003 and enjoying myself a lot and uh, having a lot of fun and ended up, ended up starting giving giving talks a, a few years ago. So I've... Uh, I think this is a uh, number five, maybe. I need to go count how many talks we've actually given, but nice. I've had a lot of fun here. Casual it's... drop in there, a couple yes. black badges. In there. That's, that's... <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not as uh, acquainted as, with DEF CON as Jesse is. I started coming to DEF CON uh, since DEF CON 19, and been speaking um, since 20, except 21, I think. Okay. Um, I didn't get a black badge. I had to make my own. <laughs> <laughs> Give a talk about that, too. Yeah. Let's just see. Yeah. Um, yeah, love the vibe. Love the community. Um, great experiences. Horrible stories. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. Well, excellent. So um, then I know that uh, Jetro over here has a lot of interesting things to say about your talk. I have some interesting things to say about your talk, but I'm not into the niche that you uh, you, you occupy. So um, I will be watching for some of the questions that come in, and uh, maybe we'll have uh, my fellow goon ask our initial question while I while I watch our channels. Sure. Yeah. So for me, I I, I watched the talk, right? I, I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, just the number of different places, the right that you could actually hide information, and uh, like a joke I was saying is like you've literally covered everything from like, hey, you need to wear a wrist strap when you go into this, <laughs> to you know Google hacking, like just run these searches and get this information to you know here's how to write the random chips and and you know code release. Um, I guess like so quick thirty seconds, like what well, I guess what's the if someone hadn't seen the talk yet, how would you recap everything for them? What are the high points? <laughs> Not, not wearing a wrist strap. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Like, let's 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 do a thirty second recap for an hour talk. Um, <laughs> What's the best part? They should look out for. Why should they go and watch it? The demo music. The demo music, great. Yeah, that was. I, I, yeah, the bossa nova thing. Well done. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So, so really, I mean, like, guys, what inspires you to take like such a complete look at the attack surface, right? Like, how did you think to start to look at all these different ways that you could go after devices? You, you want to take that, take that you, or uh, should well, I? We both have, we both have yeah. similar perspectives, but a slightly different. Um, what got us into this? Well, I'd say we got tired of getting caught. <laughs> so when, when we do the red team exercises or whatnot, and we want to hide our payloads, and we always get caught, and you know, adding in a memory and, and on, on disk and all kinds of locations, and we've had a lot of experience dealing with hardware and firmware and we thought why the hell not i mean there's so many places that everyone thinks that once you go the lower you go in the stack 
the more complicated things get, they don't actually. They they're they're way simpler, but they're just a little bit low level than most people are comfortable with. But they're not they're not too complex. And once you once you get over that hurdle, you go, oh, I can just do that. That's awesome. I'll just write firmware to this thing. As simple as that. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of mitigations in the uh, operating system and application level that there's been a lot of uh, attention there. So there's all kinds of OS level application security stuff. Looking at the file system, doing scans of the file system are, are really uh, common. And there's been a, a move more towards like fileless malware and doing stuff only in memory. But a lot of that is just you, you get code execution on the box and run fileless in or uh, just in memory but being able to store stuff in places that people aren't looking gives that gives you that additional persistence where the the loader that you actually have on disk looks completely benign because people don't understand how how these access mechanisms work in most cases so being able to have something that looks benign on disk and it'll pass all the like you can throw it up on virus total and everything is 100% clean but it still can go read the actual malicious payload out of the out of the giggy region or from some random usb controller uh, firmware that's unsigned and maybe it has uh, some uh, encryption key or something like that where the only thing that happens in memory is uh, malicious but the thing that actually happens on disk is uh, completely benign and it's a it's an interesting uh, mechanism for persis persistence, and we wanted to provide more uh, visibility into that and let people know that this type of capability exists in the system. All right, so that's, were that's you inspired. Interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, if you were inspired by any any particular research or attackers using similar techniques. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's generally been like like I said, there's been all this uh, research and and attackers in the operating system space and attackers have started moving down to the stack. Like we've seen UEFI implants. Uh, there was like a low Jax implant. Uh, there were some other ones were found in the wild. Uh, there was some, something in the, the vault seven uh, leak that was talking about a, an EFI implant that they were using there. So I think there's a, a trend towards people moving further down into the stack. And mm -hmm. a lot of these firmware components at those lower levels in the stack don't have all those same hardening pr protections that the the application and operating system has. So you don't have things like code signing protecting your firmware in the stack or firmware in the, some of these devices. A lot of these are uh, lower cost, lower power devices that maybe they don't have like a nice crypto engine built into this uh, chipset. So a lot of that is lagging behind just because there isn't this additional visibility and people going after these components and uh, it's a it's an area that's ripe for uh, exploration and exploitation. And like we talked about in our talk, uh, some friends of ours gave a, a talk about doing this type of thing using UEFI variables. And we were like, but wait, there's more. So let's, let's go out some of the, after some of these other areas. So that was kind of the inspiration for this talk. So that a lot of what you're saying here is really interesting. I work uh, way higher. I'm I'm kind of in the website usually, and yeah. there's a lot of things that have happened over the years in the website that make it harder-ish to do a yeah. lot of the, the web hacking world. Um, it yeah. sounds like there's maybe less because there's less people working in the space of attacking low level. Are there less mitigations that are that that I would run across if I got into it. Uh, that that depends. I mean, it is lagging behind to some degree. There are some. So, like pe people, depending on what what people's uh, understanding. Like you, you said, you work in the web space, so like you you may, may be familiar with web stuff. Like people can talk about like a, a full stack, and there's there's the full stack of like the like the 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 web stuff that's externally facing going down to a lot of these underlying levels of the operating system. And you can get down to the point where you end up looking at like bugs in CPU microcode that have uh, side channel implications. And there's a lot of different vulnerabilities all throughout that stack. And there's been a lot of effort to do the easier stuff that's more directly exposed to the user. But there are some of these underlying things 
some of these foundational technologies that everything is built on top of that are kind of lagging behind those uh, exploit mitigations where like when the, when the system powers on and boots up the, the the processor starts executing code at the reset vector it used to be the case that this was BIOS where there was no protections whatsoever there then people have standardized on UEFI where there's the UEFI firmware that executes and a lot of that is they're adding protections there but a lot of the times when the UEFI firmware is running, there aren't things like address randomization. Sometimes the stack and heap are fully executable. A lot of those mitigations that you're totally used to in the operating system and application space aren't there. And there is some effort to put some of these mitigations into the uh, the reference code. So there's a, a UEFI has a, a reference specification at EDK, uh, EFI de development kit, development environment and people take that specification there's a reference implementation called tiano core some of these uh, exploit mitigations are going into tiano core but there's whole this whole big uh, supply chain for getting those out to actual customer systems so there's reference code in tiano core but then independent vendors like ami phoenix uh, inside take that code add their own special sauce then the OEMs like HP, Lenovo, Dell take the code from the independent virus vendor and do their own uh, at value add. And then quite a bit later, that actually ends up shipping in production firmware. So there's kind of this, there's a lot of uh, components that are going into it. There's, and it's just lagging behind a little bit. So something going into the reference code in Tiano Core, it might not be enabled by default. And even if it is enabled by default, it's gonna take a little while before it actually gets out into the systems that are shipping to customers. So the other problem is that updating firmware is a lot harder than just pushing out a patch through some like Windows update in general. Uh, so there's, th they've tried to standardize on firmware updates for system firmware to some degree, but a lot of different vendors are doing things differently and that isn't fully easy to do yet and so there is there's the, the system firmware for your device the uefi firmware but there's also all the firmware for all the, for all these embedded controllers like the s media controller that mickey talked about and uh the there's a giggy controller that's as part of the intel pch chipset that we can write to the to that region we're not reading and writing to the firmware directly for that giggy region but there's other controllers on the system like there's a a lot of servers have a uh, Broadcom uh, 50, 5917 chip that we talked about in some research a while back that also has unsigned firmware that that's a common server uh, chipset where uh, maybe an HP uh, DL380 will have that chipset and you can write firmware there as well. Sorry, I kind of rambled a lot. Did you no, want to say anything? I, I need to change my background after that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> That's pretty much it summarizes whatever, what, what everything Jesse talked about. Yeah, so, so you, you have like a operating system security, which maybe is updated through Windows up, Windows Update or maybe uh, Debian uh, or Canonical or Red Hat SUSE repositories where they're, they're providing updates there. But there is a little bit of an effort to update firmware, but all of these different components are out there and some of them just don't have the capability to have some signed firmware. So there's a, a lot that you can do there and it, there's not a really good, easy way to fix it other than just waiting for the next generation to come out and hopefully it has the capability to have, to have signed firmware as well. Sometimes they'll have checksums and stuff like that, but it's that's not a security mechanism and it's pretty easy to, to bypass and recalculate a checksum. Excellent. I, there's a there's a lot there, and I'm sure that I'll be watching through uh, this talk <laughs> later to to make sure I get more of what you just said. Uh, we do have some questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to get to one cool. of those. Awesome. Um, so RPTK to 2015 says, "Question: Do you know of a way to write some code into one of the various EE proms that will be capable of executing code by itself without code in the disk?" Yeah, I mean, that, that depends on the, the capabilities of the specific device. But as an example, like there's all the, the rubber ducky, bad USB devices where a lot of uh, uh, flash controllers or flash devices uh, use an 8051 processor as part of the controller. And you can write firmware to that and have that essentially uh, 
act as a keyboard and inject keystrokes, mass storage, stuff like that. So if you have if you have the ability to update firmware, depending on the capabilities of the device, if it's a, an internal USB device, it might have the ability to essentially act as a rubber ducky and execute code and basically restage back from the uh, the device. Uh, we, we had given a, a, a talk a, a number of years ago, also at DEF CON, about a uh, internal uh, Huawei LTE modem that we were able to update the firmware for that. And this was an internal device, uh, basically was in an M2 uh, card that was connected to the rest of the system over a USB interface. And it essentially was running uh, a, a version of Android with the Android gadget interface inside of this little M2 card. So it was a complete Linux distribution inside of the USB device inside of your laptop or tablet. So you could essentially update the firmware there and have your payload there. The cool thing about that one is that you can have that inject keystrokes back to your tablet or laptop, and it also had a cellular connection. So you could do a, a CNC out to AWS. So that was a fun talk also that was a few years ago at DEF CON. So yes, you definitely have the capability where if you can update the firmware for the device, depending on the capabilities of the device, you ha might have the ability to uh, directly attack it again without doing, uh, without needing that uh, loader within the operating system that's on disk in the, in the file system. Additionally, if you have like a PCI device, you could potentially do DMA attacks against the system and do that same type of uh, capability. Sometimes, uh, Sometimes the operating system has DMA protections, but the boot process doesn't, and you can do an injection into the boot process while the system is booting up. Uh, there was a quick follow-up <laughs> question on uh, that from the same cool. user of, did you, uh, uh, did you use this in an assessment? Well, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we don't work as uh, consultants or, or red teamers. We, not not currently. So we, we we were on we were on a red team, and uh, we've since moved to different positions, doing more hardware and low level security. And it was like this is the type of thing that we would have wanted uh, while while we were still actively red teaming, but we haven't specifically used this on a on an engagement. Just uh, proof of concepts and, and playing around with our own systems. We've heard others use the yes. UFI trick in an engagement. Yes. But um, not the rest of it. The rest of it is just, it's so many options. We haven't had a chance to try them all. <laughs> That's the kind of the problem across the space, isn't it? There's a, a target rich environment. Yeah. So yeah. Um, while I read this next question in my head, let's see. Um, so <laughs> we'll just go right into it. it was, uh, this is from, it was like this when I found it. So the demo jumps right into, and here's this stuff, and we can write and read to it. Isn't this cool? And the natural is, it is, it totally is, plus one for elevator music. Um, any more pointers on enumerating access methods for these things? White papers? I presume you're not um, using physical methods, JTAG, or in-circuit programming, so... Point three, what APIs functions are you using for this kind of thing in general? It seems like you could drop stuff into legit update image and flash it, but it looks like this is on the fly. So a uh, couple of, uh, I can go, go through the, the TLDR of that. Uh, this, we can answer that. Well, it's going to take 15 minutes, but I'm going <laughs> to jump, jump right at it. So there are certain um, tools you can use to flash uh, a pre pre infected image like you can modify the legitimate image and then use the the provided tool by the vendor to send it to the device and have the device flash it to the to its image um, so, there, there, there was another way where where we use uh, the one of the code releases was uh, actual talking directly to the spy controller in the computer so just you're itching to say something, so go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, if you haven't taken a look at it, we do have a sample code up on GitHub now. Uh, basically, uh, GitHub uh, hacking things slash bytes in disguise that shows how some of this code works. Where I will beg you after this thing to post that GitHub to the Track 1 channel, but go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, ba basically we have some examples to show off doing things like reading and writing to CMOS, uh, es essentially, the the low level hardware interfaces that the the processor uses to talk to some of these resources 
are things like uh, I.O. ports, where there's an x86 command called in and another called out that are literally for doing reads and writes to these I.O. ports, and that's an architectural feature of the system. Uh, there's also a PCI uh, access where you can do uh, PC, uh, you can do I.O. port read and write to uh, I.O. ports CF8 and CFC in order to do what's called legacy PCI access. Uh, and then there's also what's called M uh, memory mapped I.O., where if you can read and write to specific physical memory addresses in the system, you can basically talk to these uh, PCI devices through the PCI controller. And generally, in order to talk to these interfaces, um, I.O. port, you can... You can basically do a, a privilege access like IOPL in, uh, in Linux in order to uh, set your I.O. privilege level. So then you can do uh, I.O. reads and writes from Ring 3 and talk to these ports. Uh, but in order to do reads and writes to the memory mapped I.O., those physical addresses, you generally need uh, uh, Ring 0 access, kernel access, or a privileged proxy that can do that for you. So we, we gave a talk last year about uh, a lot of drivers that provide this access for you. Basically, you can uh, do I.O. controls to talk to the driver, and then the driver will go do reads and writes to these I.O. ports or PCI access or reads and writes to physical memory. And we, we found a number of these drivers that can uh, provide this type of access. And uh, we took one of the specific examples that's... Uh, uh, pretty commonly found uh, the PMX driver from Intel, and it has a lot of capabilities. Like you can do a an I/O control to talk to the driver, and it'll do a, an arbitrary read/write to a port or an arbitrary PCI access. So we have some code that uh, shows how to do that, including things like uh, talk to the CMOS, read and write CMOS, uh, read and write uh, uh, diff different areas of memory, talk to, to PCI devices. Uh, it can. Uh, so what, one uh, complication is that if you use the direct uh, PCI uh, access mechanism in that driver, it goes through the I.O. or it goes through the Windows API functions to do that I.O., which is uh, HAL get bus by offset, set bus by offset. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that the SPI driver or the SPI device, when the, the Windows system is booted up, is actually... Uh, it's hidden. It's a hidden device. So if you try and go through the API in Windows, you won't be able to talk to that spy device at uh, uh, bus zero, device 31, uh, function five. But if you do legacy PCI access by going through that IO read write of CF8, CFC, you can directly talk to the spy controller in that device with no problem. So we have some code to, to demonstrate that and using what's called hardware sequencing, where you basically say, here's the address within the spy chip that I want to talk to. Go read 64 bytes from that and give me that data back. So we have an example of doing that. Uh, we have an example of uh, basically mapping the physical address, the, the last page of the 4 gig region, and uh, printing the bytes from the reset vector in the uh, that physical memory region. So all of that is is using this, uh, this driver and uh, DLL that was... Uh, included in a number of uh, software packages for update mechanisms. And and if that answer went way over your head, you can just go <laughs> to the GitHub. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, go, go to the GitHub and look at the code. It mostly is in C Sharp, which is uh, easier to understand than most things. It's, it, goes, it goes a little bit low level uh, at some places. But if you, if you go there and you look at the code, it's not big. It's not scary. Just take your time. If you have any questions, you can ask us later on. But um, whatever, everything yeah. that Jesse just said, and if and you completely went over your head, it's not that complicated once you spend an hour reading on the internet. It's not that yeah. big of a deal, I promise it, you. It, it should be fairly straightforward. Um, there, there are some uh, defines and register offsets that are specified for certain things like the spy controller. Um, if, if you look for the, uh, the Intel PCH uh, chipset data sheet, You'll be able to find the the definitions for those uh, for those registers and offsets. Uh, this was specifically uh, put together on a, a Cabby Lake uh, system, at least from my side. So, uh, so some of the registers, uh, like the fields, are a little bit different uh, sizes between a couple different generations. But uh, this code should work on everything from uh, Sandy Bridge onward, I believe. Well, all right, so. 
I love where you're heading with this, and this is um, particularly the way that you're explaining how to, for some of us who don't have the depth of experience in the low level stuff, you're giving us some entry points so we can go look at your code, we can uh, try and replicate some of this on our own. Are there other thoughts for those of us who might want to do this on our own? Uh, do you have other places you would like us to maybe go point and get some base experience to, you know, uh, start playing with you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, before, I before you do for anything, for <laughs> before you start playing with anything, you got to remember to if you're gonna do something with something, back shit up. <laughs> if you're gonna yes. if you're gonna experiment with non volatile memory, first learn how to physically back it up and flash it back on. Um. That that said, go go for whatever you see has a chip on it that contains data. Go wild. Yeah. To to follow up on that, there there are some things you can do, like writing to some locations in your system where the system won't boot anymore. So you'll you'll need to like physically open the case. Uh, in the case of like writes to the to uh, just bare spy chips that are that are easily accessible, like the, the BIOS or UEFI firmware or BMC firmware in a server, um, you could use something like a Dediprog with a chip clip and like physically clip onto the SPI chip and read that, make a backup copy using physical access before you start messing with it. Uh, there, there's also like, a, you can use a bus pirate to do like SPI read and write if you don't have a Dediprog, but you can often find a Dediprog on eBay for like 50 bucks or so. So. What I recommend is if you don't have, if you don't want to do that, I have an alternate method, which is you have a Thunderbolt capable device. You just plug in a PCI Thunderbolt adapter. You can pick up for a hundred, 150 bucks off Amazon. And then you just plug in one of these uh, PCI cards. This, this is one of the cards we worked on for the demo. This is a USB controller PCI device. It has its own EEPROM. And if you mess it up, it's 15 bucks. Is, is, isn't that the, Writing to, but was not the the controller you were actually writing to. Yeah, this is the same controller that I thought I was writing to, but apparently I had one in my motherboard that I've been reading and writing to. So yeah. So yeah, be be careful about doing that. It's it's nice if you can just like pull out the PCI card and and uh, your system boots again. But it's a good point. Remember, sometimes that, it's more difficult. Remember to check you don't have your target already in your computer before you start flashing it. <laughs> This is all great advice. All right, gentlemen, we are right at the end of our allotted time. Um, you two are incredibly easy to talk to about this stuff, so uh, we appreciate that. Um, I like to provide everybody an opportunity to distill a takeaway. What is the, the call to action you would like to provide for the community who is watching this? Yeah, I, I would just start out by saying like, this might seem intimidating and difficult to get into, but it's really a lot easier than you think. And if you just start experimenting with this case and do some of this yourself, it's actually a lot of fun and it's not as hard as it might initially seem. So we have some code examples you can get to. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the Intel PCH uh, chipset data sheet. It's a pretty big document, but uh, if you just look at certain things like the spy controller uh, registers, it can give you. It can help you help guide you and get you started. So, I'd totally recommend people to go. Uh, don't be intimidated by this and just try it out and see what you can do. I'm just gonna add that. Uh, um, feel free to ask other people. Yes. Uh, for advice, and uh, I'm just gonna caveat this with: if you ask me for advice, I will gladly help you, under the condition that you help others if they ask you. So don't be an asshole. <laughs> help others this is the point of community yeah that is one of the best uh takeaways that i've heard so far so you have a, a whole series of people in chat uh wanting to buy you drinks next time they see you in person <laughs> Uh, well, thank you two very much for coming and providing another deep uh, load of content for uh, DEF CON and, and all, the, all that you do for us. So if anybody has additional questions, I'm going to see if I can get these two to post um, more of their contact information in the Track 1 channel so that, uh, people, you can, uh, so that people can find you later. Other than that... I hope you have a wonderful rest of your con, and um, that's pretty much it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.